Good evening, everybody, and welcome to my third and final Gresham College public lecture series, which is going to be on the psychology of finance. So traditional financial models assume that decision makers make these decisions rationally. So they take into account all available information and process it in a correct way. But that's not the way that humans operate. Humans make mistakes, they're driven by psychological biases, and therefore there's errors that result. And so what we're gonna do over the next six lectures is to explore what mistakes people typically make, and then constructively what we can do to watch out for those mistakes and make better decisions. And we're gonna look at these in terms of decisions in the stock market, in terms of investing, in terms of our spending and saving behavior, and also those of us who run businesses or have managerial roles, how we can become better business leaders. But what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna focus specifically on the psychology of the stock market. So a fundamental question is what drives the stock market? Why do stock prices move up and down every day? Is it fundamental factors, such as profits and dividends, or is it psychological factors such as sentiment? Now, in 2020, we often are looking today at the fact that it's now the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman. So in 1970, he famously wrote this controversial article arguing that companies should focus entirely on profit and not on wider society. But I'm actually not gonna talk about the day because I talked about that in my first Gresham College lecture series on how business can better serve society. But there was another very influential article written in 1970, and if there wasn't so much focus on Friedman, I think there would be much more focus on the fact that this is also the 50th anniversary of that article. And that article was by another professor of economics and finance called Eugene Farmer. And he was also of the University of Chicago, and he famously wrote in 1970 that stock markets were efficient. And what he meant by that was that they take into account all available information when forming stock prices. And so I think this might be the only equation that I have in the slides, so don't worry about this Butch equation. But what this shows is that the price of any asset is the expected value of the future cash flows of that asset, discounted by a certain rate, given some information. So the thing here which is really important to focus on is that bar I zero. So when you're forecasting the cash flows of a company, or when you're forecasting the risk of a company, which affects the discount rate, you are taking into account all available information. So let's make that concrete with an example. So let's say you're figuring out the stock price of Apple. So what is the relevant information for Apple? Well, you might look at things like such as how is the iPhone doing against other competitor phones. You might look at the state of the economy and how it might be affected by the pandemic. And you might also think about the potential successes for Tim Cook and whether Apple has a good succession plan in place. And all of those things seem reasonable. But notice the important word here is the word all. Prices have to reflect all available information. And so what that means is that every bit of information, no matter how esoteric, that might be relevant for Apple's stock price will be incorporated by the market. Again, let's give an example. So let's say there's the possibility of a military coup in Venezuela. And let's say maybe Apple sells 0.1% of its iPhones to Venezuela. It's relevant, it will affect Apple's revenues. But we can immediately see why this might not be in the stock price. Because the people who trade Apple stock, they might focus on the US economy, and they might be experts in the tech sector, but they might not be experts in the geopolitical situation in Venezuela. So some information might not actually be put into the price, even though it's relevant. And so that's the question that we're gonna study this evening. Right? And why is that an important question? Because if the price was efficient, if every bit of relevant information was included in prices, it would mean that investors could not make any money trading on information. Let's say you knew 
that the situation in Venezuela had eased and there was no possibility of a coup. You might want to buy Apple stock because you think they're going to be able to sell more to Venezuela. But if the market was efficient, the stock price would already take that into account and you wouldn't be able to make money by trading on Apple stock. And this is not just an abstract theory or an intellectual exercise. This has really practical implications for how people would invest their money. Because one of the big developments that we've seen over the past couple of decades is the rise of passive index funds. So what do I mean by this? So traditional, if you put your money within a mutual fund, there is a fund manager, and her job is to choose particular stocks to invest in. So she'll research different companies, she'll buy stocks which she thinks has great prospects, and avoid other stocks. And because that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time, you typically pay the fund manager, say, 1% of the value of that fund, maybe every year. However, if indeed the market is efficient, then any information that the fund manager might be using when she chooses stocks is already in the market. So actually, there's no point having a fund manager because the fund manager would just be trading on old information which is already incorporated. And so that explains the rise of passive index funds. So in those funds, there is no fund manager. It's just a computer chooses stocks. The computer will just choose to hold, let's say, every stock within the FTSE 350. The idea being that no stock is better than any other. Right, so there's some companies that are doing really well. But if the market knows they're doing really well, the price is expensive, so they're no better an investment than a company which is doing poorly. So you might as well hold everything and get the diversification benefit. There's no point in paying this expensive fund manager, so instead, by buying an index fund, you might pay 0.1% rather than 1%. So this has big practical implications. Do we want to trade active stocks or just passively hold the market and diversify. Now, why is it that people will still believe in active management today, despite the arguments that I just gave? It's because prices are determined by humans. And humans, as I mentioned right at the start, they do make mistakes. They might not take all available information into account, so prices might be wrong. And we know that even though, in a rational world, prices should rationally equal this equation, people around the world go and make very serious decisions without doing detailed calculations. And so there's two reasons why this equation may not hold and prices may not be efficient. So the first reason is that people might not have the relevant information. So if you are a stock analyst trading Apple, you're going to be looking at the tech sector, you're going to be looking at the American stock market, but maybe you're only working 20 hours a day, and so you just don't have time to look at what's happening in Venezuela, so you don't have the information. But the second problem is even more interesting, is that let's say you do have information. Even if you have information, you might not understand the information, and in particular, you might respond to the information in a biased way because of the psychological biases that I'm about to explain. And the difference between the first two is really interesting because it's a bit like the difference between poker and chess. So poker is a game where you don't have perfect information. Right, you might make the wrong decision in poker because you can't see the other person's cards. So you might think you're doing really well. You don't know that your opponent is actually sitting on a royal flush, and if you've got four of a kind, you might actually want to um, try, you might want to uh, bid a lot. But people will think, is that realistic nowadays? Because there's lots of sources of information. We're in a big data world, and we can get any information that we want to. So is it realistic that we think that there's mistakes because people are uninformed? So that's where the second issue comes in, is the game of chess. 
So in the game of chess, there's perfect information. While everybody can see the pieces, it's not like poker when something is hidden. But even when in chess, even if though we can see all the information, we might lose just because we're not able to process that information. Right? Some people are better chess players than others, and we might make a mistake just because we don't understand the importance of that information. And so this is why I think the idea of market inefficiency is very compelling, even in a big data world. Even though our access to information now is much greater than it has ever been, because it's really difficult to know what information is reliable and trustworthy and how to use that information, mistakes can be made, and therefore that gives a role for active stock picking. Now, you might think, well, yes, people make mistakes, but why don't those mistakes cancel out? Well, there's human error, but if human error is random, then it will just wash out. So let's say Andrea, is always over-optimistic about stocks, and Prakash is always pessimistic about stocks. They make mistakes, but if Andrea buys too much and Prakash sells too much, then they're going to cancel out, and there's not going to be any effect on the overall stock market. But here's the important thing, is that what unites Andrea and Prakash is human psychology. Right? Because they are both humans, when they make mistakes, they're going to be making mistakes in the same direction. For example, what did we see in the internet bubble um, of the turn of the millennium? It wasn't just Andrea was getting excited about the fact that there were these stocks which seemed to be doing really, really well and bid them up too much. At the same time, Prakash might have been on the bubble and got overly excited about this frenzy. And if they are making mistakes in the same direction, then they're going to be buying those stocks. And similarly, in a crash, when people are fearful, people will be running away, just like any type of psychology. So if, there's, if you're being attacked by a spider, most people would run away from that because there's the common psychological bias that people don't like animals that look like that. So given this, given that people have made, make these mistakes, the questions are, what mistakes do people make based on psychological research, and then using those mistakes, can we predict what is going to happen to the overall stock market? And so what I want to do here is to take some of the most common mistakes that have been documented. And one of the mistakes is overreaction, the fact that people overextrapolate from small bits of information. So one example is, let's say this weekend you, well, you can't go to a football stadium, but let's say you watch a football match. And let's say there is a team, I think it's going to be the third game of the season, a team has lost three games in a row. Well, what's going to happen? People will call for the manager to be fired. Well, it doesn't matter if he was successful the past two seasons. If you lose three games, then people will get extremely upset about you. And then in contrast, if you're a striker, and you've scored three games in a row, people will think, well, this striker is going to be amazing, let's buy him, and they will bid up his price too much. So what this means is that people will over-extrapolate from small bits of information, and they will see patterns when there's actually randomness. And some of you will know Nassim Taleb's book, Fooled by Randomness, where you over-extrapolate from chance events. Why? Because over the course of a 38-game season, there will be times where you just happen to lose three games in a row. Just like even if a coin is fair, if you toss it 38 times, just statistically, you are going to find streaks of three heads or streaks of three tails. It doesn't mean that the coin is biased any more than a stream of three losses necessarily means that the manager has lost his touch. Now, let's translate that from the sports field into the stock market. So what does overreaction mean in the stock market? Well, it might mean that this is what's the cause of a bubble. So let's go back to the internet bubble. What caused it? Well, there was some good news that happened about tech stocks. Maybe there was a certain company 
that doubled its revenues over the last six months. But then investors got really excited about this and thought, well, maybe they will keep doubling their revenues over the next six months and the following six months, not realizing that at a certain time, competitors will come in and compete this away, or maybe the business will mature and it can't grow so much, so they will over-extrapolate from a small bit of information. So given that, well, how can investors, how can savvy, rational investors exploit this? It's by doing what's known as a reversal strategy. So let's say we stand here in September 2020. We can take all stocks on the UK stock market that have done really well over the past three years. And let's call those stocks the winners. And then we can also take the stocks that have done really badly over the past three years, and we're going to call them the losers. And we're going to buy the losers and sell the winners. So I've called this a reversal strategy. Some people call this a contrarian strategy. And if we buy the losers and sell the winners, it turns out that over the next three years, there is this reversal. So the last three years losers now become the next three years winners. And what's the interpretation of this? Is that, well, what is a loser stock? It's something that did suffer mildly bad news, but the market over-extrapolated and thought the news was really bad and so overly sold the stock. And conversely, with a winner stock, they had mildly good news, but people overly got excited and that's why you had things like the internet bubble. And not just the internet bubble, the real estate bubble, the biotechnology bubble, even the tulip bubble in the Netherlands. And the fact that we keep seeing these bubbles throughout history means that there must be, it's quite likely that there's some unifying psychological bias which causes all of them. And I think one of the most um, plausible ones is the idea of overreaction. So that's one strategy that people indeed play. You'll know many investors who are known as contrarian investors who will want to buy these beaten up stocks. Another simple thing that you can do, and another main type of investment strategy, is known as value investing. So what do I mean by value investing? So one of the most common financial ratios that you'll see if you opened up the Financial Times is the price earnings ratio. It shows you how much you need to pay in order to get a company with one pound of earnings. So let's say there's two companies. They're both earning one pound today, i.e. their profit per share is one pound today. One of those companies costs five pounds. Another company costs 20 pounds. You might think, well, that's crazy. Why would some cost 20 for the one pounds of earnings? whereas the other costs only five. Well, the rational reason, if you believe Eugene Farmer, is because of growth, right? The one which is costing 20, yes, its earnings are only one pound today, but they're expected to grow far in the future, and so that's why you're willing to pay 20 rather than just five for the other company, which is slow growth. But that's true if the world is rational, the difference in prices can be fully explained by the difference in growth prospects. But if we allow for irrationality, then it could be that the reason why one company is trading at a price earnings ratio of 20 is just due to overreaction and overexuberance. Yes, it's got good growth prospects, but maybe the market thinks it has amazing growth prospects, and so it bids up the stock price too much. Again, that's a hypothesis. And again, what we do as researchers, we test that with data. And indeed, a very, very famous study looked at a very simple trading strategy where you buy value stocks. They have low price earnings ratios. They are cheap. For a given amount of earnings, you're not paying a high price. Let's buy those value stocks and sell the glamour stocks. So those are stocks with high price earnings ratios, like they would be the tech giants that we'd see right now. And what they found was that over a long time period, that typically made money. So those beaten up, out of favor stocks would outperform the glamorous ones.
And let me pause just to highlight just how crazy those trading strategies are and how inefficient it implies the stock market is. Because to put on this strategy, all you need to know is you need to know how well the stock did over the past six, 36 months, because if you did badly, you want to buy it, and also its price-earnings ratio, because if it's low, you want to buy it. You don't even need to know what the name of the company is. You don't need to know what industry it's in. You don't need to know who the CEO is. All you need to do is to look at those statistics. And indeed, this is now why we have a lot of computer-driven funds, which will trade purely on the basis of its recent performance, its valuation ratios, and some other factors, highlighting the fact that actually the market might be inefficient. Okay, so that's one bias that people make. They over-extrapolate. But let me go to a second common mistake that people will make, and this is the idea of underreaction. And what's the underlying belief? What's the cause of underreaction? So one of the famous causes is confirmation bias. And that's something I talked about in a Gresham lecture last year called Critical Thinking, and also my TED talk, What to Trust in a Post-Truth World. And the idea about confirmation bias is that we will latch on to any news or any information that confirms what we would like to be true, and we would reject any information that contradicts it. And indeed, many people think that this was at play in terms of the slow reaction to the pandemic. So when there was evidence suggesting that this was something to take seriously, there was some slow incorporation because people just didn't want it to be true. They couldn't believe that a pandemic could cause a huge problem in the economy, and so people were slow to react. They just didn't want to believe it. Now, again, let me translate that away from the, um, from the natural world into the stock market. So what does it mean to underreact in the stock market? Well, let's go all the way back, not as far as 1970, but let's go back to 1981. And you are an analyst, and you are looking at Kodak. And Kodak, in 1981, had just crossed $10 billion of sales for its film business. But in that same year, Sony Mavica just launches the digital camera. Now, how do you respond? Well, what many investors responded with was with nothing. Like they thought, how can these digital cameras start taking over? Like Kodak is such a large company, it's got $10 billion of sales. They just couldn't fathom the fact that this business could completely disappear within a couple of decades. And so if that happens, what we find is underreaction to information. Like particularly when there's information that goes against our prior belief, we typically will bury our heads in the sand and ignore it because of this strong idea of confirmation bias. Now you might think, well, haven't I just confused you? Because on the last slide, I said that people overreact, and now I'm saying people underreact. Well, that's a bit confusing. How do we know whether people underreact or overreact? Well, here's the thing. It depends on the time scale. People tend to overreact in the long term but they underreact to information in the short term. And so this means in terms of a trading strategy, let's try to have the same trading strategy that we had last time of winners and losers, but let's now define winners as stocks that did well over the past six months and losers as stocks that did badly over the past six months as well. So we're looking at the past six-month performance, not the past 36 months. And it turns out that now, if we look at the most recent performance of just six months ago, we want to buy the winners and sell the losers. Because over the next six months, the most recent winners stay winners, and the most recent losers stay losers. So while in the long term we have reversal, something goes up and then goes down, in the short term, we have momentum. So what's the interpretation here? Well, it's that if there's a company which had some good news announced, the stock price goes up, but it doesn't fully go up. Why? 
It might be people don't notice the information, or they do notice the information, but they ignore it because it goes against their prior belief. Maybe they have in mind this company is just a deadbeat company which is, up, which is never going to do anything exciting. Yes, there's positive information, but I'm going to ignore it. But it, indeed, the stock keeps going up afterwards. Why? Because that information was truly good, but people just ignored that. And this is similar to how there was reaction to, well, underreaction to the um, COVID pandemic. And similarly, on the downside, right, what happens with a loser company, it had negative, it had quite bad news, but people underestimated that, and it didn't go down enough. Now, there's also some interesting follow-ups to that. Now, this study was first published by two people called Jagadish and Titman in 1993 in the Journal of Finance, the top academic finance journal. But you might think, these people were crazy. Why did they publish the study? They should have just kept this study to themselves, traded on, on the stock market, and made tons of money. Why did they just expose this and tell everybody in the world that there's a strategy? Well, what was really interesting is that eight years later, in 2001, they redid this study, and they found that momentum was still profitable. And this goes back to my idea that what's causing these strategies is psychological biases. So psychological biases are really hard to eliminate, even with scientific studies. So go back to that spider image. If I told you, look, this spider is really safe, I've done a scientific experiment, if I was to unleash that spider on you, you still run away because you just don't like spiders. And similarly, if there's studies showing, right, you suffer from confirmation bias, you should really change your beliefs and react to information and be more open-minded, people will still not change that and will still have the tendency to reject information that doesn't confirm what they would like to be true. And you might think, well, 2001, that was still 19 years ago. Why am I presenting this paper right now? Well, there's a more recent study, which is called Value and Momentum Everywhere, which finds that even in a more, more recent time period, we still see the profitability of momentum. And the everywhere here is really interesting, because while the original study looked at stocks and in the US, what this study did is looked at not just stocks. It looked at bonds, it looked at currencies, it looked at commodities. And not just in the US, it looked at Europe and Asia around the world. And it found that in nearly all cases, you found both that value strategy, which exploits the fact that people get overly excited by glamour, and the momentum strategy, which exploits the fact that people underreact to information. And again, I feel this is convincing. Why? Because what unites humans, regardless of whether they're in Asia or Europe or America, and regardless of whether they trade stocks or bonds or currencies, is that they're all prone to these psychological biases. Now we can dig deeper in this, and they get even more interesting. But because what is driving this, the fact that we can make money on momentum, it's the fact that people make mistakes, and they might make mistakes because they just don't have information about a particular company. Well, if that's true, then we should see this to be particularly pronounced in small stocks. Why? Because in big stocks, like Vodafone or Apple, right, they're getting coverage all the time. We can see in the newspaper what's happening, so most information is already probably going to be in the market. But a much smaller company, which is not on the front pages, they might be ignored. And similarly, equity analysts, those are institutions like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley who write reports about companies, they are a way of spreading information. So stocks without many equity analysts following them, they might also be stocks about which the average person is uninformed and not reacting to information. And indeed, a very clever follow-up study found that momentum, the slow reaction to information, is particularly pronounced in small stocks and in stocks with little analyst coverage. OK, so let's now take a, a check as to what we've learned so far, is that the stock market is inefficient, it overreacts sometimes, but it underreacts partic 
quickly in the short term. So my next part is, well, yeah, the stock market underreacts, but what does it underreact to? And here is what's really surprising. Because you might think, yes, you're going to underreact to information like changes in the military situation in Venezuela, because that people might not be noticing. But it actually turns out that the stock market underreacts to even the most basic information. And so the most fundamental information about companies is how much profit they make. Right? So every three months in the United States, companies announce their earnings. And everybody pays attention to what happens when a company is announcing their earnings. Indeed, there's a lot of concern that investors actually pay too much attention to short-term earnings, and they're not thinking enough about the future. So what happens when a company announces its earnings is that before they've made that announcement, you have these equity analysts, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, predicting what they think the earnings will be, and that's called the earnings forecast. And so when the actual earnings comes out, how do we know whether the announcement was good news or bad news? You compare it to what people thought it was going to be beforehand. And so if the actual earnings exceed the forecast earnings, that's known as a positive earnings surprise. The market was surprised positively because the company did even better than expected. And similarly, you have negative earnings surprises. So what this study did was the following. It took stocks and it divided them into buckets, but now they divide them into buckets not on past performance, but on the magnitude of the earnings surprise. So you had some companies that did really well when they announced their earnings, and they're going to be in bucket 10 here. So what have I have got, I've got in this graph? This study was written a long time ago, which is why the, uh, the diagram looks like this. So on day zero, but you look at the date in which the earnings are announced. And not surprisingly, that pun was not intended, but not surprisingly, the companies with the best earnings surprises, they had the stock price jump on the day of the earnings announcement. That makes sense, but it's good news when a company's earnings beat expectations. But here's the really interesting thing it continues to drift up afterwards. So the stock market is really slow to respond to even information as important and as salient as earnings. So it means that, let's say you were 20 days after the earnings announcement, and you say to your friend, oh, you know Apple, 20 days ago, they had a good announcement of profits. Let's buy Apple stock. Your friend would say, that's crazy. That's old news. That happened 20 days ago. How can you make money trading on old news? But you would actually be right. Why? Because the market is slow to react even to that information. It continues to drift up after those 20 days. So this phenomenon is called post-earnings announcement drift. It's that the stock price drifts after the earnings announcement in the same direction as the original reaction. And we get drift which is even more pronounced on the downside. Right, so there's companies which announce bad earnings, the stock price drops, but it continues to drop afterwards. Why? Again, it might be people ignoring the information, they might not be seeing it, or it might be that they just don't want to believe it because of confirmation bias. They think, well, this company is a great company, Yes, it announced bad earnings, but maybe it was just unlucky. So again, what we can do is we can dig deeper. So with momentum, I showed you that momentum existed. And then I said, well, where is that going to be more prevalent? It's going to be small stocks and stocks with little analyst coverage. And suddenly, if we have this idea of drift, when is it going to be even more pronounced? And here are some very creative studies. One of them found that it was particularly pronounced when other firms were also announcing earnings. And the idea here is distraction. Right? On a busy news day, when loads of companies are announcing their earnings, right, if you're an investor, you don't have time to analyze every earnings announcement. So there could be a company with really good earnings, but you just didn't notice it. You just didn't have time to process it. 
The next one is even more creative. They found that the effect was even stronger when earnings were announced on Friday. So what does Friday matter? So let's say a company comes and announces its earnings at 4.30 p.m. on Friday. Are you going to be staying in the office and redoing your valuation model? No, it might be that you're going to be off to Monte Carlo to spend the weekend or something like that. And so you might think, I think I'm going to get round to doing this on Monday. But by the time Monday comes around, you've got another 50 things in your inbox so you don't get around to analysing this. And so what this means is that when companies announce their earnings on Fridays, there's less of a reaction, there's more of an underreaction, and so there's more drift afterwards. And here's one of my very favourite studies, which shows that the effect is particularly strong in terms of a slow reaction for a customer earnings announcement. So what's all that about? So let's say there's a pharmaceuticals company which announces bad earnings. Who is it bad for? Well, it's bad for that pharmaceuticals company. But it's also bad for the chemicals company, which supplies the chemicals to that pharmaceuticals company. Right? If your customer has had bad things happen to it, it's going to be bad for the supplier. But you might not notice that. Why? Because how these uh, investment banks and how these um, funds are divided is they're often divided by industry. Right? So I used to work in investment banking in the chemical sector. And because I was already spending 20 hours a day studying these chemicals companies, I just didn't have time to figure out what was happening in the pharmaceuticals industry. So what that means is there might be relevant information happening in a different sector. And because people specialize by sector, they're not going to be noticing the information. And so here's a really clever trading strategy. If a company has bad earnings announcements, you short the supplier. And what the study found was that um, you would make 17% per year by trading on this. So this was designed by um, Lauren Cohen and Andrea Fazzini, where Andrea used to be at the University of Chicago. And he just got sick of actually being with Eugene Farmer telling him that markets were so efficient that he decided to leave and then set up his, and, been, and now join a hedge fund where he's implementing these strategies and doing very well on the basis of this research. Okay, so you might think, haven't I just explained something which just seems really irrational, right? Because I've said, okay, there's a lot of this misreaction to information, but if indeed there are these trading strategies which are here, there's a lot of money on the table, why don't people just exploit this? And here's one of the key underpinnings, not just behind this lecture, but the entire lecture series as to why these inefficiencies can persist. And this is the idea of limits to arbitrage. So what is arbitrage? That is the idea that if there is a trading strategy, then if you're a smart investor, you should be able to exploit this. Right? Why isn't it that people are trading on things like the earnings anomaly, just like Andrea Fazzini is now doing. He's one person, but why aren't hundreds of people doing it? And here's the issue. So let me give an example. So it used to be there were two companies, Royal Dutch and Shell. So they're both within the energy industry. And they decided to merge with each other. So normally when companies merge, one company buys the other company. And so they thought about, Let's have Royal Dutch buy Shell. Now, if that happens, well, then, then the company is going to be headquartered in the Netherlands. Maybe Shell's former shareholders are British pension funds. And they might think, we don't want to hold a Dutch stock. We're going to sell our shares, and that's going to drive the stock price down. That's something known as flowback. And conversely, if they chose it to be in the other direction, if Shell bought Royal Dutch, yes, the UK pension funds would still be happy holding Shell, but the Dutch pension funds, who used to be holding Royal Dutch, they might say, we don't want to hold this British company. Let's sell the shares. So what happened when they merged is rather than having one company buy the other, they decided to keep the two companies as being separate, but instead they merged their assets. 
So Royal Dutch and Shell merged all of their energy assets together. They kept the two separate companies in the Netherlands and in the UK, but then they agreed that any profits which came from those assets would be split 60% to Royal Dutch and 40% to Shell. Why? Because at the time that they combined the assets, Royal Dutch's assets were worth one and a half times what Shell's were. And so what that means is that means that at any point in time, theoretically, Royal Dutch's shares should be one and a half times what Shell's shares are. But that's theoretically. Right? There's nothing in the real world to say that this equation needs to hold. And so what happened was that if, indeed, the Dutch stock market did really well, then all Dutch shares did well, then Royal Dutch went up, and maybe this, which should have been one and a half times that, it became two times it. People forgot that Royal Dutch and Shell should be linked. Instead, Royal Dutch went up with the overall exuberance of the stock market. So you might think, well, if that's the case, isn't there an easy trading strategy here? If Royal Dutch is too expensive, I'm going to buy Royal Dutch, and I'm going to short Shell. But the problem is, whatever irrational exuberance caused Royal Dutch to go up, it could get even worse. So maybe the Dutch economy does even better, and now Royal Dutch is now three times the price of Shell. Now, you as the investor, you're making a loss because you've bought something, and then it's actually gone down in value. You hope that it will go back down to one and a half to one, but in the interim, it's gone worse from two to three, rather than down to one and a half. And you might claim to your investors, oh, stick with me, trust me, yes, I've made a loss, but I'm going to turn it around later. But the investors might not believe you, and so they will force you to liquidate and sell your position at a loss. You were, um, went into the position at two, but then you had to exit at a three, and then it's worse. And so what that means is that even in cases in which you think there's textbook arbitrage, there is a surefire way of making money, the real life is not like the textbook. Because whatever mispricing is out there could get worse in the short term. Therefore, you, even though you're a rational investor, you might not put all of your money onto this position because you know that if things get worse, then you might get liquidated in the short term, even before there's the chance for the prices to correct and for you to make money on your strategy. And so that's why I believe a lot of these mispricings can persist, and that's why I still believe that there is a role for active management even today. So in the final few minutes before questions, I'm going to change my tack completely. So the goal of today's lecture was to show that the stock market is affected by um, psychology, and not by fundamentals. Now, there's two ways to do that. The first way is to show that the market does not incorporate information that it should. And that's been the bulk of the last um, part of the 40 minutes of the lecture. I've shown you various bits of information that are relevant, but are ignored. But there's a second way of doing this, which is to show that the market does incorporate information that it shouldn't. Even irrelevant information affects the stock price. And some of this irrelevant information might be people's mood. Whether traders are happy or unhappy actually drives the stock market. And so there's studies which show that the day of the week affects the stock market. On Friday, people are happy because they're looking forward to the weekend. The stock market goes up. On Monday, they're unhappy because they have to go back to work. The stock market goes down. What about the weather? Like when it's sunny, the stock market goes up. When it's cloudy, the market goes down. Similarly, when the day gets shorter, people suffer from seasonal affective disorder. When the clock changes, that messes up people's sleep patterns. And all of these things have been shown to affect the stock market. However, these papers have not been fully um, believed because people think, well, yes, there was a statistical relationship but it's what's known as a spurious correlation. It was just a chance random pattern in the data. And so this means that people can find effects even if they're due to luck. So if I was to run a hundred regressions trying to predict the stock market with a hundred variables, 
even if those variables were nonsense, five of them will show up significantly at the 5% level just due to chance. And we know that some crazy trading strategies, like you can predict the stock market apparently by seeing who wins the Super Bowl in America, even though there should be no effect of that on the stock market because it's irrelevant. And indeed, this is some of the criticisms that people had about some of these earlier studies. Should indeed weather affect the stock market? Yes, well, weather affects your mood if you are a farmer, if you're outside. But the people who trade stocks are protected by air-conditioned and heated offices. So weather shouldn't really make a difference. And do clock changes make a difference? Right? So, OK, when the clock changes, you're deprived of sleep. But anybody who's traded stocks or worked in an investment bank will know that traders are really good at getting by on little sleep, right? Because if the clock changes and the sleep patterns are messed up, they'll just have another shot of espresso. They'll be just as effective as before. So what I wanted to do was to look at a mood variable which was so strong that it was something that you could not neutralize by turning on the heating or air conditioning or by having some coffee. And so what I chose to look at was the effect of sports results on the stock market. Right, so why did I look at sports? Because this leads to huge effects. So when countries win, they become elated. If they lose, like England getting locked out of the World Cup, you can have hugely negative effects. And these are effects which are so strong that they can actually have some effects on health. So there's studies that show that when England lost to the 1998 World Cup to Argentina on penalties, Heart attacks shot up, so unfortunately people died because England couldn't take penalties. And in Canada, people commit suicide when the Montreal Canadiens are eliminated from the Stanley Cup. And so while in England and, and in Canada, unfortunately, people's own health is affected, in the United States, rather than killing themselves, unfortunately, people kill each other. So murders go up in the major city after a team is eliminated from the National Football League playoffs. And so, the series, on turning to the serious stuff, what this means is that the effect of sports results can be so strong that it can affect people's emotions and affect how they trade the stock market. And so, what I wanted to look at was the effect of international sporting events. Why? Because I couldn't look at something like Premier League football because if Liverpool beat Chelsea, as happened on the weekend, then some Englishmen are happy and some are unhappy. And so it's hard to say what's going to happen to the overall stock market. But if you look at the World Cup, right, if England lose, then the whole of England is upset, and that could drive the stock market down. And also we want to look at major sports, because while not everybody is affected by seasonal affective disorder, sports such as football in the UK and France, they're things which have a large impact. And uh, so we looked at 1,100 um, observations, plus some other sports, and we wanted to look at the effect on the stock market with my co-authors, Diego Garcia and Ivan Norley. And so here's what we found. We found that when a country is knocked out of the World Cup, then the next day the stock market falls by half a percent, even after controlling for other things that might be driving the stock market. Now you might think, well, half a percent, is that a lot? Well, but half a percent is a huge amount because when applied to the UK stock market, that is 10 billion pounds wiped off of the stock market just because England can't take penalty kicks. It can lead to a stock market dive. And also, it's stronger in the World Cup than it is in the new European Championships. Why? Because the World Cup is the bigger stage. And it's stronger in the elimination stages, like the quarterfinals. If you lose, you're instantly out. Whereas if you lose in, say, the group stages, you could still recover and win. And we can also find where is it most important, right? So we looked at the top seven football countries. Now, the top seven is not, designed, is not defined by ability, but by fanaticism, which is why England can count in the top seven. So it's England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Argentina, and Brazil. And what we found was that in those sports as well, we found, um, in these countries, we found an even stronger effect than in other countries. So other countries don't care about football, but what do they care about? They might care about other things, such as cricket in South Asia, rugby, ice hockey, and basketball. And in three of the other four sports, we found the same effect, 
was that losses lead to a significant decline in the stock market. But there was no effect of wins. So sports can only lead to negative outcomes. And so why is that? Maybe for two reasons. So the first reason is that, well, there's asymmetry in the competition format. If you lose, you're instantly out. If you win, you're just through to the next round. You could still lose. And second, supporters are notoriously over-optimistic about their team's chances of winning. For not 50 years, but 54 years, England fans have thought we're going to win another major championship, but that hasn't happened. So if you are always thinking you're going to win, if you do win, you're not too surprised. But if you lose, you're bitterly disappointed. So you might think, well, is this a serious sudden? Why am I ending on, on this note? This seems sort of fun, but what does this teach us about what drives the stock market? But I do think it's serious. Why? Because what we're looking at is not whether football drives the stock market, but whether emotions and sentiment drives the stock market. So there's many other things that we can use which affect a country's emotions, like a plane crash or an election or a pandemic. That affects your emotions. But they also affect the stock market. Right? A plane crash has an economic effect. Whereas whether a country wins or loses a football game does not have as large an economic effect. So that was a way of shocking emotions and sentiments without shocking economic fundamentals. And so by showing that even a pure measure of sentiment affects the stock market, that suggests that what drives stock prices is not purely rational behavior, but it's emotions and sentiment. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Alex. What a brilliant lecture. Fascinating. Lots of questions um, coming up. We will only be able to take a few of them, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, so let's kick off with this one. Okay. Do people overreact to bad news that has only short-term implications? Yeah, so I think there's overreaction to, to many things, and it would include things with only short-term implications. And so that's the idea of projecting things into the future, thinking that the effect of something will be much longer lasting than it actually is. And so that's something which has been documented. Good. Um, another question. Despite all efforts to discredit the efficient markets hypothesis, is it still not the case that passive funds beat most active funds over five years, especially when fund charges are taken into account? Yeah, that's indeed true. And so this is why I think the passive index industry has done quite well, is that if you just look at the average index fund, that beats the average actively managed fund when you take charges into account. But I wouldn't say that that was necessarily strong evidence for the efficient stock markets hypothesis. Why? Because if we take actively managed funds, you're combining lots of good funds with lots of bad funds. And so there could be people trying to trade on information but making mistakes. But if there are ways of trading on information in ways that process that information correctly and ensures that you're free of these behavioral biases to the extent possible, then you might be able to beat the market. And so if you think of some strategies like the likes of Warren Buffett, which is not to be driven too much by short term and by emotion, but instead to look at a company's long term prospects, the fact that he can systematically outperform, that does suggest that there might be some systematic inefficiencies that savvy and rational investors might be able to profit from exploiting. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, does the current divergence in the economic reality versus the resilience of financial markets, is this a sign of market efficiency, inefficiency? So potentially. So, so what people have, have tried have focused on, if you read The Economist and other financial press, is the divergence between the real economy and the stock market. So the stock market has rebounded substantially since the initial fall from the pandemic, yet the economic fundamentals seem to be pretty, pretty weak. And so there some people might be arguing this is irrationality because people have got overly excited about the resilience of these companies when actually COVID might have some permanent impacts. And we might be seeing this now with the possibility of a second wave. So that might be people not wanting to believe that the effect of COVID is, is long lasting. OK, two final short questions to put you on the spot. What do you believe is the most influential psychological factor that varies investor decisions? So I seriously think it is it's confirmation bias because it's something that I've seen so prevalent and why I gave the Gresham Lecture last year 
on critical thinking. I could have done that about any bias, but why I saw it in confirmation bias is I feel that is just particularly prevalent in any decision. Even in, in COVID, right? If you're somebody who wants there to be another lockdown, you're going to latch onto any findings showing that we need a lockdown. If you're somebody who opposes the lockdown, you can easily find a study finding the opposite. And in today's big data world, you can always find evidence to support whatever viewpoint that you want to support. And that's why I think uh, confirmation bias is a particular problem. Great. Lots of um, people at home scribbling down that. This is the big one. Okay. This is the big one. What is your best advice for students investing in the stock market? I think it's to rec recognise the fact that um, you... Are, are not an expert in, in, in these things because you are trading against professional fund managers who are every day looking at these companies and talking to management. And so this is even for me why I, as a professor of finance, you might hope that I know something about finance, but I also recognise that I, I just don't have the same access to information or the same access to management or actually the same time to, 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 to invest. So I will very rarely invest in single stocks Instead, I will invest in mutual funds, which will invest um, across a, a, a range of stocks. And those might be based on themes that I think are, are based on mispricings in the stock market. And this is actually going to be linked to my next lecture, which is on hidden investment opportunities. So there's certain factors which might be mispriced by the stock market because they are certain things that psychology overlooks. And one of the factors is intangible factors like employee satisfaction. So for about 13 years, I've been, been investing in a mutual fund called the Parnassus Endeavour Fund, which invests in companies that treat their work as well. But because there's many investors who think, well, a company that treats their work as well, that's a fluffy company that's distracted from the bottom line. They don't fully recognise the importance of ethical treatment of employees, and so those companies are too cheap, and that fund has performed very well over the past 13 years. Well, that was a wonderful tee-up for your next lecture, which we all look forward to. Right, so thank you so much to everybody for, for, for tuning in, and I hope to look forward to, I look forward to seeing you, some of you at the next one on hidden investment opportunities. Thank you.